Mr. Kamal Janawi was Foreign Minister of Tunisia from January 2016 to October 2019, where he played a key role in garnering support for Tunisia's democratic transition and promoting peace in the region. Under his time in office, Tunisia secured a non-permanent seat on the UN Security Council. He previously served in the Tunisian Foreign Service in various diplomatic posts, including Russia and the UK. He has received numerous honors, including the commander of the Republic Order in Tunisia. He currently serves as a distinguished non-resident fellow at the Atlantic Council in Washington, D.C. He also is the founder and president of the Tunisian Council for International Relations, a think tank he helped set up in 2021. It can be visited at tcir.org, link which will be in the video description. Mr. Dinawi, thank you so much for joining our show. Thank you for having me. I'm really delighted. Thank you. So, Mr. Janawi, how would you summarize Tunisia's role in the world? What are the current priorities? Well, let me, if you allow me, make few comments about Tunisia itself. Tunisia being, you know, on the top of North Africa, the closest country to Europe. Uh, it's at the heart of the Mediterranean, and it is situated in a crossroad between the East and the West, and it aspired, uh, uh, you know, to uh, play the bridge between the African and the European continent. Uh, Tunisia, of course, uh, uh, has been, uh, since its independence in 1956, trying, you know, to uh, 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 contribute to the peace in the world and uh, uh, to be active in its own uh, environment in the Mediterranean area and the North Africa, in Africa and in the Middle East, and uh, play the major role sometimes, you know, uh, developing and advancing the agenda for peace. So you mentioned briefly about Tunisia's location, and it's in a very unique situation where it's both part of the African world and in the Arab world, meaning being a member of the Arab League and the African Union. So two members, two very distinct memberships. Uh, how does it navigate relationships with these organizations and leverage them in regards to foreign policy objectives? Well, uh, indeed, uh, we have a dual uh, affiliation to Africa and to uh, the Arab world. Uh, and by the way, Tunisia itself gave the name to Africa. It uh, it uh, used to be, uh, you know, the African province of the Roman Empire when this place used to be called Cart Carthage, uh, a major power in the Mediterranean, and then the name spread to the whole continent. Uh, Tunisia was very instrumental in founding the uh, organization of the African Union in 1963, and uh, later on, uh, it played a major role 2002 in its success. Uh, it has been very active, you know, contributing, you know, uh, and integrating the African space uh, by joining different uh, uh, sub-regional organizations like uh, the ECOWAS in uh, 2017, then joining the free trade continental uh, area zone uh, in 2018, and then becoming member of the uh, ECOWAS, uh, which is, uh, uh, sorry, in uh, COMESA, uh, the uh, com common market for uh, eastern and southern uh, part of Africa. Uh, so uh, we are uh, 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 an important player on the African continent and trying to develop and expand our economic and political uh, relation, you know, with Africa. With the Arab world, uh, Tunisia joined the Arab League in 1958. Yeah. It has been a very active member within within that organization. It just hosted in 2019 uh, the uh, 30th uh, summit of the Arab League, where most, if not all, leaders, Arab leaders, attended that summit. Uh, so we still, uh, you know, having this both affiliation and trying to navigate between Africa and the Arab world which are not uh, contradictory because uh, both uh, communities, the African as well as the Arab world, as you know, constitute the largest uh, group within the United Nations. Uh, they used to be part, uh, uh, an important part of the non-aligned uh, 
movement uh, when uh, there was the uh, Cold War. Uh, and today they play a major role within the United Nations institution, particularly within the General Assembly of the, uh, uh, the United Nations. So can you explain more on the domestic front, how Tunisians view themselves in regards to the identity with the with being in Africa and being Arab? What is the Tunisian identity in regards to being part of this unique concept of two regions? Well, Tunisia, first of all, it's a Mediterranean country. It's, as I said earlier, it's at the heart of the Mediterranean. We are proud of that uh, roots. Uh, this is a country where, uh, as I said earlier, uh, used to be uh, an important major uh, power, uh, maritime power, the Carthaginian, and you know the Punic War between the Roman Empire and uh, Carthage, and the relation between uh, Carthage and Greece. Uh, so uh, there is this uh, important dimension of the uh, Mediterranean dimension. Then, uh, as uh, you know, uh, uh, we belong, we are part of Africa, we belong physically uh, uh, of uh, Africa, and we have been interacting with the sub-Saharan Africa for a long time. Uh, actually, Islam, uh, when it came on the 7th century to this part of the world, started with Tunisia and then spread to North Africa and to sub-Saharan Africa. So we have a very strong link with the, with the African continent, uh, besides, you know, being proud of our Mediterranean uh, roots, uh, because uh, we had uh, a very old civilization going back 2000, almost uh, 2,500 years ago. Uh, and the Arab Muslim, you know, civilization uh, started here on the seventh century, and then we uh, Tunisia became a kind of melting pot uh, because of the successive, you know, uh, uh, invasion and uh, uh, you know different groups coming uh, to invade this country, and they liked it so much that they decided to settle down. So the whole population is a kind of a melting pot. Very interesting story, hearing about the history and the unique uniqueness of the migration, the location, and how that plays an impact in Tunisia today. And on that note, looking at something more modern, Tunisia played a pivotal role in the Arab Spring. Um, the transition to democracy, something you've been very um, instrumental in, uh, was closely watched by the international community. Can you please provide an overview of how that Tunisian foreign policy has evolved since this time? Well, uh, it start, all started here in Tunisia in 2010, on December 2010, in the center of Tunisia in a small country called Sidi Bouzid, when with the self-emulation of a street vendor, you know, Mohamed Bazizi, which, you know, uh, ignited uh, a kind of an uprising uh, in the whole region for uh, pro-democracy uprising, and people look, you know, uh, looking for reforms uh, and asking entrenched authoritarian, authoritarian regimes, you know, to uh, accede to their demands for more freedom, more democracy, and more dignity. Uh, it's uh, quietly, relatively succeeded in Tunisia and in Egypt, but unfortunately in other countries like Yemen, uh, like Libya, Syria, uh, those countries fell, you know, in the civil uh, Pro, uh, civil uh, wars. Uh, uh, so uh, uh, since then, uh, the whole the impact of those transformations and the transformation of the last ten years, of course, impacted on our uh, orient policy uh, foreign policy orientation. We we tried to explain to the world the importance of Tunisia becoming uh, uh, a democratic nation. Uh, because we feel that there is a stake here, not only for the Tunisian people, which are aspiring to become, you know, a democratic, uh, uh, enjoy the democracy, uh, uh, democracy rule, uh, the respect of the rule of law and uh, uh, good governance. Uh, uh, so we had to uh, convince our partner, immediate partner, particularly the European Union, but also the United States and other Western countries about the importance of. Uh, uh, you know, the success of this experience, telling them that investing in the success uh, of the Tunisian experience is less expensive than, uh, God forbid, if that uh, experience uh, failed. Uh, so now we are in the middle of that experience. We have made, uh, you know, uh, important steps towards establishing a democratic uh, 
democratic uh, nation, a democratic institution. We are still uh, building on that with you know some up and down experiences, but still uh, we have to convince our friends to continue, uh, you know, helping Tunisia, uh, you know, going to uh, on that path by particularly helping the Tunisian economy getting out of the crisis because Tunisia is uh, facing today a major economic crisis because it, ha it was badly hit by the COVID-19, uh, then by the uh, impact of the ongoing war in, uh, uh, in Ukraine, particularly Tunisia is importing two major products. You know, uh, it imports 50% of its food stuff from abroad and it imports uh, energy. And these two products, uh, you know, were very impact, uh, very badly impacted by the uh, by the war, by increasing their prices and making them, you know, inaccessible for a country like Tunisia. Tunisia today, uh, of course, is uh, negotiating, trying to conclude negotiation with IMF uh, to get, you know, uh, a loan for two billion a loan in order to finance its budget yeah. in 2023. Uh, the whole uh, focus of the Tunisian government of course, is to try to secure as much as possible uh, foreign financing to its budget. Uh, it is not an easy task in, uh, in the geopolitical situation which the world is witnessing uh, today. You mentioned a lot about trade and exports and imports, and I know something you were very involved with during your time as foreign minister is this concept of cultural diplomacy. Tunisia has very rich cultural heritage, and you try to leverage that to improve Tunisian tourism and help with trade. Can you just share a bit more about this, please? Well, uh, uh, Tunisia, as I said, has a very long history. Uh, uh, so uh, it has a very rich uh, cultural heritage, and uh, it uh, uh, tourism being a very important economic sector, which was badly hit, as I said, unfortunately, by the COVID, but also before that by terrorist activities. Uh, now we are trying to, uh, you know, uh, give more visibility to that uh, cultural heritage and trying to explain to the world that coming to Tunisia, you are not going just to enjoy the beautiful uh, beach landscapes and sceneries, but also to enjoy uh, a very rich culture, uh, which is, uh, uh, you know, uh, of course, I spoke about Carthage, but also there are different other civilizations which succeed in this country from the Byzantine, then the Spanish, then the French, and of course the uh, Muslim, Arab Muslim heritage. So there are plenty of things to see in this country. Uh, the tourism sector is a very important se economic sector. It represents around 7% of the GDP, and there is a focus to use all the tools to market Tunisia abroad. And just before we go more into it on your career, something, another question we got submitted in by one of our listeners is that uh, Tunisia's history, being a former French colony from 1881 to 1956, uh, how, has, has, how, if any, has French um, colonialism history impacted Tunisia's foreign policy outlook over the years? Well, I don't think it's it impacted uh, on the foreign policy itself because we have our doctrine, as I said, which we, uh, our first president, uh, president, uh, late president Bourguiba, you know, laid down uh, doctrine based on the respect of law, the peaceful settlement of uh, resolution, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, and having zero problem with all our neighbors and our partners and trying to expand our relation with, with different partners regardless of their ideological affiliation. Uh, France being the, uh, the first Tunisia foreign partner of Tunisia from the trade point of view, uh, we have a very strong, uh, of course, cultural relation with that country. But Tunisia has been diversifying its relation long time ago, even before its own independence. So we have, for example, now a very strong relation with the United States, where yeah. we started the bilateral relations in 1797. 1797, uh, sorry, 1779. Uh, from uh, the John Adams, you know, uh, presidency, uh, Tunisia established, uh, signed the first agreement, uh, uh, trade and friendship agreement with the United States. And since then, in 1800, the United States used to have a consulate here in Tunisia. And since then, the United States has been a staunch supporter of Tunisia and a very important partner of, uh, of this country. So uh, with China also, we have a, good, a very good relation. 
and uh, Tunisia is part of the uh, Silk and Road Initiative. So we are with with the French. Besides consolidating, you know, uh, our important relationship with France, the former colony, uh, uh, co colonial power. Uh, but still, now it's it's a partner. We don't see our relation, you know, on that uh, on that uh, level. But uh, still, uh, since then, we are trying to diversify our relation, east and west. Yeah. So on the note of east and west, we are seeing in various parts of the world, and I'm seeing this from Australian perspective, where there is strategic competition between the between the U.S. and China. Uh, especially here in this part of the world, in in, um, in Australia and the Pacific Islands, what's the situation like in the North African region with strategic competition between the the superpowers? Well, uh, it's exactly like Australia. It's uh, it's uh, a kind of universal, you know, uh, feature now. This global competition between powers between China and the United States, but also between other uh, major important uh, powers. Including Russia, and with with the global with the geopolitical transformation going on now, uh, particularly in Sub-Saharan uh, Africa, uh, with the wave last waves of uh, coup d'état, you know, witnessed in many countries in that part of the world, uh, uh, there is a very uh, fierce competition going on between the diff these different you know uh, powers uh, particularly between the west and uh, the west in general and uh, what we call the global south uh, tunisia yeah. and this part of the world is part of the global south and uh, unfortunately we are failing now uh, in a new uh, you know a kind of uh, cold war competition different but still there is a competition for influence in this part of the world uh, basically, you know, by increasing, you know, economic interest uh, from these powers, trying to find ways to increase their uh, political influence also on this uh, part of the world. So it's it's an international game. It is not just related to this part of the world. Uh, just going back now to your time in office, you, under your leadership, Tunisia secured a non-permanent seat on the United Nations Security Council for the 2020 to 2021 term. How important are the multilateral bodies like the UN for Tunisia? Well, it's very important. Uh, Tunisia being a small country, it's a relatively small country. So uh, we uh, give a lot of importance to the uh, UN umbrella as a guarantee for our protection and security. So we have been uh, a staunch supporter, staunch supporter of the UN uh, uh, organization and we have been working very closely with them. Uh, uh, in 2019, that's the third time Tunisia became yep. uh, a non-permanent member of the Security Council. Uh, uh, we, the agenda we were representing at that time both the Arab world and also in Africa, Africa, among three other uh, two with two other African countries. Uh, so uh, uh, our agenda uh, on that uh, position as a non-permanent member of the Security Council is to advance the peace agenda in Africa, and Tunisia has been playing an important role in uh, peacekeeping. We had, uh, since two, uh, 1960, 24 peacekeeping missions in the world, mainly in Africa, and uh, we... Uh, uh, we, we, we tried, you know, to use that seat within Security Council, as I said, to uh, work with other colleagues, uh, the P5 members, but other members, uh, to advance uh, the uh, peace agenda, and particularly also the development agenda in the world, and the role of women. We focused uh, on the role of women uh, in the peacekeeping mission. Uh, you know, uh, Tunisia is in a very advanced situation compared to other uh, Arab and Muslim world uh, in the, uh, uh, in regard to the uh, woman statute. Yes. And we thought that was a good opportunity to uh, project our own experience for uh, the role of human, a woman in society and particularly in peacekeeping missions. Speaking on the importance of multilateral initiatives, Tunisia is both a member of the OIC and also the Arab League. Uh, in 2019, when you were the foreign minister, Tunisia actually hosted the Arab League summit. 
Can you just explain to our audience what the importance of these organizations are for Tunisia? Uh, it was a very important summit uh, because uh, you remember in 2019 there was some difficulties, particularly among the Gulf countries between Qatar, uh, Egypt, and other Saudi Arabia and the Emirates. Uh, that difference you know, was there. Uh, and Tunisia worked so hard to invite all the leaders from the region to be present in Tunis, and all of them, all of them, without an exception, uh, came to Tunis and, uh, uh, you know, attended the summit. And we had a very good summit because there wa it was an opportunity for uh, to help, you know, uh, the reconciliation among uh, different parts of uh, the Arab leaders, uh, you know, some of the Arab leaders. And uh, the outcome was quite positive because uh, particularly regarding, you know, the Middle East situation and uh, uh, the uh, importance of developing cooperation among Arab countries. Uh, something else that happened during your time in office was you had to mediate in the Libyan conflict. Can you please reflect more about this? Well, Libya is a very important uh, country for us. We have a common border of almost 500 kilometers. Uh, so whatever happened in Libya had its own impact on Tunisia. And so we had a, a, a specific stake to help our neighbor and brothers in Libya uh, settle that difference peacefully. Uh, we, uh, in 2017, we initiated, uh, you, know, an, uh, you know, a kind of initiative uh, associating Algeria and Egypt. The three of us, Tunisia, Algeria, and Egypt, we met a number of times at the level of Minister of Foreign Affairs in order to convince our uh, neighbors and brothers, Libyan brothers, about the necessity for them to sit around the table and try to settle their difference peacefully. Uh, we set a, kind, a number of principles uh, which were later used by the United Nations uh, that there is no possibility of having a military solution to Libya, to the Libyan conflict, that the Libyan conflict has to be settled peacefully among the Libyan themselves without the foreign interference under the United Nations, you know, supervision, because the only institution able, you know, to uh, uh, see that uh, whatever decision made by the Libyan uh, 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 last will last is the United Nations United Nation having the capacity to implement whatever decision endorsed by the Security Council of the, uh, the United Nations. So uh, we, we worked uh, for almost uh, three years uh, trying, you know, uh, to, uh, uh, to support the effort made, may, uh, made by the UN representative at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, but unfortunately, uh, Libya uh, is still, you know, divided into uh, government, and there was, uh, as you have witnessed, I'm sure, uh, yes. you know, still uh, some, you know, uh, f fights going on, uh, sporadic fights going on uh, from some uh, time to time. So what do you think is the best way forward in regards to this conflict? Well, the best way, first of all, uh, it's it's very easy for them is to focus. Uh, the Libyan themselves should focus on their own interest, uh, avoid, you know, dividing their own countries, and uh, and keep uh, keep you know uh, other uh, foreign interference uh, away from their uh, uh, domestic affairs. Libya today is unfortunately is a space of a proxy war. Yeah. of many uh, small and big, you know, powers trying to advance their interests through Libyan uh, actors. Uh, that is not good for Libya. That's not good for the whole region. Uh, you mentioned as well, just briefly, about the collaboration you did with Egypt and Algeria in regards to the Libyan crisis. And you also mentioned earlier on in regards to the different sub-regions in the African region and uh, with Tunisia being part of the North African area. Can you just explain more about how Tunisia coordinates or cooperates with some of the other North African, uh, your neighbors, uh, with Morocco and some of the other countries in that area? Well, uh, uh, Tunisia, Algeria, Morocco, uh, Libya, and Mauritania, we are supposed to be part of a sub-regional organization called the Arab Maghreb Union. Unfortunately, yeah. that organization is completely frozen. 
because of the conflict between Algeria and Morocco on, this, on the Western Sahara. Uh, it's the uh, absence of the Arab Maghreb Union costs Tunisia a lot. It costs us almost 3% of our yeah. uh, growth rate, economic growth rate every year. So we are trying to develop our bilateral relation with each of these countries, with Algeria being the immediate neighbor you know, of Tunisia. We share with Algeria a common history, common interest, but also a common border. And uh, we are, Algeria has been, uh, Tunisia has been, you know, supportive of Algeria since its struggle against the French rule, but also Algeria was supportive of Tunisia since 2011 when we faced the terrorist, uh, you know, threat. And we, uh, we have uh, developed uh, uh, a very important uh, confidence uh, relation, confi confident relation between the two countries. With Morocco is uh, another country which is important for Tunisia. It has been a staunch support of Tunisian e experience since uh, our early uh, years of independence. We have developed and expanded our economic bilateral relation with Morocco. We can do more, but uh, as you know, the geographic uh, proximity uh, has an impact on trade relation between the two countries. But still, uh, Morocco is a very important partner uh, with Tunisia. Libya, unfortunately, uh, because of the instability witness yes. of that country, uh, we, we lost a lot you know, uh, of uh, the trade we used to have with that country before the revolution in 2011. And just as we're heading approaching time, one final question is as, a, as both an academic and as a former foreign minister, what's your strategic wish to where you'd like to see Tunisian foreign policy over the next five years? Well, I think uh, the most important uh, for us uh, is to stabilize the Tunisia domestically, uh, revive its own economy, and expand relation with our uh, traditional partners, particularly our immediate partner, the European Union, uh, yeah. which uh, represents around 70% of our trade. It's the first trading partner of Tunisia. 70% of our exports and imports come from Europe. So we have to consolidate that uh, those relations with, uh, with Europe. We have to diversify our relation with the United States, with uh, other uh, countries, China, why not with Australia? Uh, and uh, we have uh, uh, the foreign policy in the coming years should be uh, an important tool to import more investment, more innovation for Tunisia. And Tunisia has to play an important role, you know, in interacting with other countries, uh, you know, in these uh, uh, technological fields. This is Janari. Thank you so much for joining, talking foreign affairs and educating and enlightening our audience to Tunisian foreign policy. Thank you. Thank you for having me.